I mean, the thing I find interesting is we think of science labs and this isn't quite this type of science lab you usually think about, yeah, right? definitely. Not the type of science lab I'm used to working in either. Right. So here you have the, a field lab. Mm-hmm. As a field biologist, is this what you expected? You know, I'm not sure what I expected when I moved from being a mostly lab-based scientist into the field, but the facilities here are actually pretty nice. Are it's they? just that you need to especially working in a place like out on this island, you just need to be a little more creative about the type of material you use and get to know how to use duct tape really well. I even saw duct tape <laughs> on the shower uh, patching down by the tile and I was just thinking about that this morning. Is <laughs> duct tape is universal. It is, it is definitely. I mean, we use it for labeling, we use it to hold our nests into their roofs. We... Kate, did you always plan on being a biologist? You know, I, I think I did. When I was little, I really wanted to be a marine biologist because I loved seeing the Jacques Cousteau <laughs> shows. And then when I went to college, I decided I wanted to be a geneticist. But then I worked in a couple labs doing things like yeast genetics and found out that had a problem connecting those studies where you look at what one of the things I was doing was looking at a specific type of protein channel, but I was looking at a beta subunit and a specific splice variant, and I had, I had a lot of trouble connecting that to a bigger picture. Right. And so then I um, tried to be a lab tech for several years and tried to, because I knew I wanted to do science and biology, but I didn't know what field was going to be right for me. For young scientists or scientist wannabes, mm -hmm. they might be, you know, lifelong learners. Yeah, definitely. What kind of advice? I think it's really great to just keep your mind open and always be willing to explore new areas. For a lot of people, and for me too, I was really dead set on this genetics idea and it took me several years to convince myself that it was fine for me to look in other directions, explore new things, and after three or four years I found, I started working in a honeybee lab and it was really, I just loved it. Right. So I think if you can keep, keep your eyes open, keep exploring, you'll always find something really interesting and new. If you had to tell me what was your hardest subject in school, what would it be? My hardest subject in school would have been chemistry. Chemistry? Definitely. Yeah. Biochemistry or just plain organic? Organic yeah. chemistry was okay. difficult for me. <laughs> okay. And then what was your favorite class? My favorite classes actually usually were English literature. English literature? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yep. Right. And when I started grad school, my advisor told me he could tell I had taken way too many English classes when he started reading my um, first drafts of papers. I can't imagine, actually, that someone would say you've had too many English courses. I really like to make complicated sentences with lots of subclauses. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> so okay. he's like, oh, too many English courses. Right, so what we want to do is uh, get you into the kidifying mode, you know, write it it's plain language, right? Right, right, and that's important for science communication because you're talking about really complex ideas, so if you try to use complex and difficult language, it's just compounding the problem. So it's a, a real skill that some people have, like on the Ask a Biologist website, where you can put these complex ideas into straightforward language. And, so, Barrow, Colorado Island, middle of the Panama Canal. Yeah. This is your laboratory. Mm -hmm. You actually take a boat just about every day that you need to work here, which yep. is how many days a week? I work here six days a week. So, six days a week you take mm -hmm. the boat to work. Yep. Yeah. It's a pretty great commute. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. Have you ever been caught in a storm? Never, actually. I've, had, I've been on the little water taxis a couple times when it was raining pretty hard, but never during a big thunder, lightning, okay. windstorm. And so if you were to pick one of your favorite things about Barrow, Colorado Island, what would it be? Oh, I think it's just being able to walk on the trails and you see all sorts of animals. You see like army ants everywhere, there's different kinds of birds, there's toucans, there's monkeys everywhere and agoutis. So it's, it's really cool. <laughs> it's like working in a zoo. Right, right, a living zoo, and, mm -hmm. and I have to say it's about the same experience I've had where, you know, you'd be walking along and every day is a new adventure. Oh, yeah, and it's, it's incredible. So when I'm doing my observations and studying the bees, it's easy to focus on that, but on days when I'm just walking around the forest looking for sticks that might have nests, so spend hours and hours picking up 
dead sticks, looking at them. I have to wear headphones, so I stay focused on that. <laughs> it's funny, I'm, I'm recording this and I, I'm doing two things. I'm looking at the top of my, the brim of my hat where there's this ant walking along. Uh -huh. Just as we're talking about nature everywhere. Right, exactly. And, and sometimes we're trying to keep nature away from us, you know. We yeah. got these fashion statements with our socks, exactly. you know, wrapped in, well, our pants tucked inside our, our socks. And oh, yeah. Yeah, we look like ultimate nudes. Well, you don't look, yeah, you well, don't I look like my, a nerd. You look really kind of cool, fashionable with your, yes. with your <laughs> yellow boots. That's the brightest right. color boots on the island, I, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, well, and talking about keeping nature out, um, so this is a lab space that's right on the edge of the forest, and a couple times this year we've actually had army ant raids that have come into the lab, and so to keep them out, we keep our bees in these boxes up on those little tables and cover the legs of the tables with this really sticky chemical substance to keep the ants out. Oh, interesting. So we go to a lot of kind of take extreme measures to keep the ants from eating all our bees. An army ant raid. I love yeah, it. it was it was pretty exciting. They, there's been a break in, but in this case it wasn't it wasn't a person, it wasn't a human. Exactly. It was, it were the army ants. Thousands of army ants. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you been stung or bitten, I should say, by uh, an army ant? I, I can't have. remember if they have a stinger as well. Yep. Uh, do they? The army ants have a stinger as well? I think so. Okay. So actually, I mean, there are two types of ants, as we know, mm -hmm. two basic types, and right. then ones have stingers, and I, and I have to go look at my taxonomy on them, I guess. So, you're on the edge of the forest, and you get to basically have a living zoo every day. Yeah. What is the thing that you miss the most? Oh, what is the thing I miss the most? I think it's going to be really prosaic, but. What I really miss is being able to order lab supplies and have them come the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can understand that. Yeah, next day service is kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. I, I actually, maybe to put it more broadly, because it affects other aspects of my life, I really miss the ability to not have to plan ahead. <laughs> right, or to capture the moment. Sometimes you right. might have you might have planned ahead, but mm -hmm. here we have this opportunity to do something that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I could imagine that would be something mm -hmm. to, to to be missing. You know, again, I'm just amazed at this this what we call a, a field lab. And what is this net over here? Oh, so that's a mosquito net. We use it to open our nest in. So you can see down here is some sticks where we've had we've opened and found some nests inside. You can see the little bee tunnels. Oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. So wow, cool. And so this has been basically destroyed because we pull out the brood cells to raise, right. raise the developing larvae and pupae. Right. But we've got a lot, and we also find a lot that have been opened for us and all the brood removed. By some animal? By some animal. We've never right. seen what's doing it. Um, someone suggested to us that it might be silky anteaters, which is it's pretty cool because people hardly hmm. ever see them. But if if it is them, they are all over the island because they get a lot they, of nests. They get a lot of nests? <laughs> okay. So how many bees have you raised? How many bees have you been the mother to? Oh, hundreds this year. Hundreds? Great. We had a really, there's a lot of bees in the forest this year, which is great. And the kind of bees that you uh, raise aren't the normal kind of bees. No, no. And they're, um, so actually it's interesting and it took me a long time to process that too, but most bees are actually solitary. Most different bee species are solitary. They don't have these big colonies like you see with bumblebees or honeybees or the stingless bees that we see all over Latin America. Right. And these, you know, I got, actually got to see some. Uh, they're incredibly vibrant. I mean, almost like like jewelry. Oh yeah, they're beautiful. I really the orchid bees that I work with, especially, are just beautiful colors. In Panama, we mostly have blue and green metallic shiny orchid bees. Uh, if you go into Costa Rica, for some reason, they're more coppery and bronzy and red, but they still have a few green. So it's this amazing diversity of species, and they're just incredibly beautiful. And that's another use of iridescence, mm -hmm. which is a yeah. really cool thing, a different way of getting this color. Right. Uh, not like paint, not like a pigment. Mm -hmm. It actually is a really interesting structure. And we, we talked about this on Ask a Biologist with one of our previous guests on the radio show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he works all on the iridescence. In this case, he's okay. working on 
butterfly wings. Okay, sure. Right. So we see it in the fronts of a lot of birds, like mm -hmm. uh, hummingbirds. Right. Iridescence. That's a great example. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of the beetles have mm -hmm. some very cool iridescence. And now, uh, your bees, you know, these. Oh, they're are, incredible. The orchid bees, I have to say, are great. And then, what was the cool material, what was the chemical you were using just to attract them? Because there were no bees. Right. And within minutes, we had bees. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different chemicals that you can use there. And the main thing they have in common is that they all have really volatile scents, so scents that disperse really well into the air so the bees can smell them. And what, the, what we were using was primarily a chemical called cineol. That's an extract from cinnamon type material. Ah, so we like cinnamon on our bread or mm -hmm. our, our uh, maybe our, um, what is it, um, French toast. Right. Uh, they like it as well. Yeah, to they like it in... So what are the, these are the males that are coming, right? Right. And so they're, they're loading up on the scent for what reason? Well, they're loading up on the scent as a signal. So they use it when they're, we think they use it when they're doing these displays, whether to keep other males away from their territory or to attract females to them. It seems to be some sort of signal about um, that the males want to give off to seem like a great male. Oh, so the macho male has more scent. That's right. The macho male wears the most cologne. <laughs> oh, okay. And so that means other males that don't have as much scent say, oh, you're more macho. And then for the ladies, it's like, whoa, cool. Right, maybe. And we still, are, people are still looking at to see if it's more scent or if it's a specific blend of different scents. That's, oh. the, that's most important. So great. It's something that's ongoing. So, are, are you thinking about staying in the tropics and in the rainforest? Yeah, I think, I, I really like it down here, so I think I'll definitely plan to stay for a little bit longer. All right. Thanks again, Kate. It was great. Okay, thank you, Dr. Biology.